Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Reeks, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile art dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome today to our lovely guest, Fran Brammer. Hi Fran. Hello. Hiya. Right, Fran Brammer is a textile artist and tutor specialising in freehand machine embroidery, living and working in the historic city of York in the north of England. Fran originated in Worcestershire, moving to Yorkshire about 25 years ago to take a post teaching art and design and ceramics, then textiles, digital photography and a few other things beside. She made the decision to leave education a few years ago and succumbed to the allure of a historical costume making course. She currently works a few hours a week for the Viking Loom and hosts workshops for them, as well as taking private commissions for both costume and the art textiles, but spends most of her time producing work for sale and exhibition. The textile pieces, Fran still sees them as drawings, record what is seen understood and experienced about the landscapes she enjoys, exploring the subtle forms and layers of pattern of the Vale of York and the Yorkshire Worlds and the stark theatre of the Yorkshire Dales and Moors. The freehand machine embroidery is worked in layers over a background of dyed and appliqued fabrics. The surfaces are often cut into and frayed, scrubbed or re-dyed, areas whipped away or textures exaggerated. And as Fran says, my sewing machines work hard and are soundly abused, but I think they forgive me. There we are. That's a wonderful introduction to your work, Fran, and welcome. Now then, before we get started with your stitchery story today, would you like to share with us what you are working on at the moment and what has got you excited? Right, at the moment I'm having a little bit of a shift. I'm trying to draw in various strands of my textile practice. So a little bit of costume making. I like adding text to garments as well. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to bring that side into my landscape work. It's at the headache stage, (laughs) whether it's working or not yet. But it's quite fun. It's an interesting plan. (laughs) And I think... That's the thing, isn't it? Everything, when, whenever we try and create anything or, or really work on anything, there is always that headache phase. So I love how you describe that, the headache phase, yes. <laughs> oh, I have lots of those. <laughs> now, I saw a picture on your, was it your blog or your Facebook page recently where you were doing a picture of the worlds and you made some, a small coat or something. I know you were yeah. been learning what's happened with the text. I thought that was quite funny, where it said moo. Yes, yes, that was one of these lovely ideas which didn't quite work. Fortunately, that part of the coat has become buried, so it no longer says no. Excellent. And what made you decide to try and bring together your costume and your landscape work? Was there any particular thing that set you off in that direction? Well, it began many, many years ago, actually. I mean, I've always dress made and constructed, and I've also always also done hill walking Mm -hmm. and when you get down to it what we're doing there is we are looking at a three-dimensional form but reading it in terms of lines and contours and edges and I started to get a blurred idea that the two things were related in some way this idea of sculpting with line and Mm. it's gradually been moving towards a resolution Mm. Uh, I not sure I'm there yet, but it's an interesting journey to go on. Yes, it is. And I like the word journey as well, because uh, well, I'm quite an active person and I, I do like walking and being out and about and exploring the countryside. And as I was saying before we started this chat, you feature work about the, the, the Yorkshire worlds and the dales. In my childhood and my teens and, and all through my life, I spent a lot of time walking and hiking around there, particularly in the worlds um, when I was involved with scouting as well. So it's an interesting parallel that between the shapes and then bringing in, bringing in clothing as well, which is also very important when you're out hill walking too, although I'm sure I haven't seen any bright orange cagoules <laughs> em- embroidered anywhere yet. Not yet, not yet. <laughs> I'm sticking to plain just at the minute. <laughs> Fantastic. 
And I was very intrigued about the historical costume aspects as well. Now, I know you, you said you still do some commissions for that. That's an interesting place where you can also create texture and, you know, a lot of historical costume had beautiful embroidery on it as well. Yes, certainly. I mean, the detailing, some of the Victorian Regency stuff, which is the things I know best, Mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic. The intricacy of it, the way they would take what is quite a simple fabric and just elaborate and elaborate. And some of the construction methods have changed so completely. So it's a different way of thinking about the body and fabric, which I guess is what's got me to thinking and hills and seams and things it's an interesting connection as i say i'm nowhere near the bottom of it yet (laughs) well we'll have to keep our eyes out and see what to see what comes next that's really great and how did you therefore get interested in embroidery and textile art to begin with who taught you what did you do and anything you can share with us there Fran? oh it's a long saga i'm afraid (laughs) the best ones always are (laughs) My grandmother left me a little bit of money when I was about 16 and I invested in a, well, what was then a high-tech sewing machine. It was an early computerized one. Mm -hmm. It was round about page 28 or 30 in the manual. I still actually have that upstairs. (laughs) And it talked about feed dogs. Such a lovely phrase. How can you not want to find out what they do? And, well, that's where it started. I found out that I could move the fabric in a freehand way. I was no longer constrained to stitching in straight lines or in one direction. And it just turned the sewing machine into a drawing instrument. That's very true. It is very much like a drawing drawing instrument. And people often talk about drawing with stitch and drawing with the sewing machine. Yeah, so you're doing that quite a long time now then. (laughs) Hence the soundly abused sewing machines. Yes, very much so. (laughs) And and moving from there, were there any particular styles that you started to work in? Did you just carry on then with the free machine embroidery or did you, you know, when did the other kind of threads start to get brought into your work? Well, I've always stuck with doing the freehand. Yeah. But again, you know, this interest in the dressmaking, the costume making, the things like that. So it's also always been about manipulating fabric, pulling it. I mean, I painted for so many years, but nothing could really, really get me away from the fabrics because you handle them, you feel them, you trash them in my case quite often. (laughs) Yes, I'd I'd seen quite a few uh, examples there where you'd kind of pulled the weave and frayed things and and it gives a lovely lovely open texture as well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It also has this ephemeral quality to it I love the idea of when I'm walking in the landscape I'm not just walking now I'm seeing all the scars all the changes which have been made to that landscape over time and so I like this idea of there being fragments of histories being told in a physical environment and then replicating that in your work yes and certainly around the worlds and everywhere you, you are quite often tripping up over history as well so other than the landscape Do you have any particular inspirations that have struck you over the years and also currently, Fran? Well, in a more abstract kind of concept, I do love textures. I love the surfaces. I like, as I've been saying, the stories they can Mm -hmm. tell. I also love working with that contrast. And with fabric and thread, you've just got so many variations that you can play with. The idea of finding textures as well as generating them is really quite exciting. And what process do you go through to find textures? How, how, how do you do that? Well, getting out there and looking is the key one. Mm-hmm. I mean, I always travel with my sketchbook. And sometimes you resort to doing things like rubbings of all sorts of bits and pieces, you know, anything from a manhole cover to an interesting decayed wood texture on the end of the gatepost. And, of course, photography these days is Mm. so accessible. Yes, I mean, I certainly, when I'm out and about, you do finish up taking tons and tons of photos, don't you? (laughs) Think, Oh, yeah, that'll make a lovely picture. That'll make a so-and-so. And And then, like, over the years, think, oh, I've still got all those photos. (laughs) Yeah, most of them I never 
look at, I yes. guess. But it's the act of taking it. Yes. That moment of focus, which is probably more important than the actual photograph. And the, the excitement and the potential that these things can actually create. I live by the sea here. I kind of have my either run along the seafront or, or go walking along the seafront. And now, obviously, it's very grey and I can't see anything at all other than my, my back wall. But normally, the, the sea changes. And the reason why I like it so much is every day the sky and the sea are different, different colours, different just everything and if I aren't careful I would just fill up the world with pictures of sky and sea just for the sake of the fact that I actually quite like taking pictures of the sky and the sea and every day I go oh it's silvery today oh yesterday it had a pinky glow to it you know the day before it was brown because it rained and it was like yeah it's it is kind of inspiration do you have any other sorts of inspirations that come to you Fran? Um, Not really unless it's through the art side where I'll be looking at you know, line, tone, mass, and all those other formal elements. As mm-hmm. part of it. Yeah. And sometimes they come across very, very strongly when I stitch, which I think is kind of cheating. <laughs> it's good fun. Well, the thing is, as, as we are looking at things, things go into our head and sometimes they pop out again with our fingers and we're not consciously recreating anything in particular. It just yes. comes into our heads and then think, oh, well, that might be a bit similar to so-and-so, but you haven't consciously done it like that. It's just in that moment of creating, yeah, you make it, it happens. Mm. And I'm, I'm very, very strongly visual in my bias. So... I will pick things up quite often. Later, I will see where that idea came from, how right. that tied in and why that connection was made. Yeah. As you say, I, I call it festering. Yes, yes, I fester ideas as well. <laughs> <laughs> you just stack them in at the back of the head yes. and every now and again the card pops up and off you go. Yeah, well, I'm glad somebody else does that, yes. Percolating, that's another one. That, uh, oh, that's a nice word. Yeah, you? percolating. It sounds a bit nicer than festering. <laughs> I think I probably am truly a festival. <laughs> so you've touched basically on the, the, the free machine embroidery. So I guess that we could class that as being your favourite technique. Yes. Do you have any other techniques that you weave into that? Why do you like them so much? Uh, why do you keep coming back to them? Well, I mean, I do use a whole host of techniques. Mm. You know, like using the raw applique, scrap applique, you know, collage bits and pieces. As you pointed out before, the deconstruction, you know, pulling things apart so you're left with fragments, which is always great fun. And in amongst that, I will be throwing bits of dye around, tea stain, all sorts. I quite often have work, I have one at the moment, hanging out in the garden, getting weathered. All right. That's an interesting idea. Well, how, long, how long has it been out there? Oh, about four weeks. But really? I really don't like it, so it's going to be out there for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It just knocks the stuffing out of it. <laughs> I'm sure it would, yes. It really int- does. Yeah. So, things are, so it's really, if you do that with it, then it's going to fade quite a bit and get a bit tatty around the edges with the wind, I suppose. Yes, and that is it. I don't like having total control i don't like that i like things arguing with me fighting back (laughs) i have to adapt i have to be creative in my approach rather than just dictatorial i I like that the idea of your textiles arguing with you yes i can i can see that they all have apparently i call everything him usually because i've built up this rapport with it where it's either being very nice to me and doing exactly what i thought it might do or it's arguing <laughs> it's not giving what I want and I have to give more to get back what I need from it how do you go about selecting say colors and materials now the reason why I asked this is I, I've, I came across a, I think it was on your Facebook um, page which a post which actually made me made me laugh there was this gorgeous roll of 
multicolored thread and you were and you were bemoaning the fact that it was so pretty and gorgeous and why does everything have to be pretty and gorgeous and you wanted moody and miserable or something and I did have to laugh because it did the first thing I said oh isn't that gorgeous isn't that lovely colors and then when I read the text you're like oh why why, why does it have to be so gorgeous (laughs) I'm very good at moaning (laughs) (laughs) well it has to be trial and error Mm. I mean as I said I, I paint a lot so I'm used to mixing colours in a physical way, but you can't do that with thread. And the way the colours interact is so completely unexpected sometimes. Yes. On yes. my blog, I bewail yellow. <laughs> because I use a lot of green, the yellows all start turning green by association. Yes, yes. You know, they're not very brave. Mm. They don't stand out there and hold their own ground. So you have to balance it out with different colours, different colour combinations that you probably wouldn't use if you mm. were paint. But that's the way you have to do it. It has to be trial and error. And I don't like, you know, doing the standard thread painting. I will layer colours to build yes. up a surface. So I'm constantly battling. But Back to it, the battling again. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's <laughs> fabulous. I hate knowing what I'm doing. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I've been experimenting with starting off with things like bright imperial purple and orange as yeah. base colours. Right. And then I end up with these gloomy, moody moors, you know, and there's hardly a speck of orange to be seen, but it has to be there to lift the other colours so they work with each other. Yes, and I think when, when we see pictures of landscapes, and I've looked at some of yours, it's where you see colours that you don't expect to be there but actually are when you look properly it's not just green and brown and things there are it's like we say back to the sea and the sky the sea the other day was this absolutely gorgeous kind of pink colour but if you kind of drew a picture of the sea that was pink people would think it was an absolute nutter what, what, what pink sea that was a silly well actually it was pink on the day when I was looking at it it was a beautiful sunrise and it was pink <laughs> Yeah, I mean, nature isn't always in very good taste. Mm-hmm. It has its moments. Whereas if you dare to put that down on a canvas, people will just think you actually made it up. Or if you yeah. did it a photograph, they'd say you photoshopped it. No, it's it's amazing. What, well, everyone was going on about the colour of the, the, the sky, weren't they, early on this week? Yeah. It was that kind of weird orangey colour and all the rest yeah, of it. So, yeah. Orange, yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, I, I do like your approach to colour, I have to say. <laughs> What would you say, therefore, moving on, has been the high point of your textile art and embroidery journey so far, Fran? Is there any particular points where you look and think, yeah, I was really, really chuffed about what happened? Or, you know, um, I, you can share. I think that would be probably the first time I did the York Open Studios. Right. Textiles is quite often a very lonely place. Mm. You know? beaver away in the quietness and that was probably the first time I realized just how many people in this area want to do it are right. interested in it mm. who are willing to come out of their little world and step into mine and how many of them actually want to be part of it that was fabulous that and getting lots of compliments <laughs> and so have you done that have you done that a few times um, I've done two and I've just found I've been accepted for this coming year's one. So the 2018 version, I'll be here again. Right. And whenabouts does that happen? In what month is it? April. Right. And one of my earlier guests, Bernadette Kahn, she, oh, yes. yes, um, she was exhibiting and I think you were exhibiting at the same, yes, same at venue. Yes, that, yeah. that would have been it. So, yes, she'd mentioned you to me. Oh, when, when we, okay. So um, I knew you had been exhibiting locally as yeah. well. So Yeah. I mean, having a, a nice local gallery who's willing to take things in and who sort of looks at things and says, OK, that's fabulous. They are so supportive. And that's what we need, isn't it? We need some support of people who are interested in what we're doing and very importantly, as you've said there, to share. So we can share what we're doing and share our experiences and just share with people who kind of understand what we're doing and want, you know, want, want to do it as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there is no substitute for enthusiasm. 
Very true. Yes. I, I always describe myself as an enthusiastic embroiderer and a textile art dabbler because that's really what oh, yeah. I do. You know, my, my, my main way of earning my living is through my online marketing and podcasting yeah. services and so on. So my textile art is very much a hobby in the background. But I, I like sharing as well. You know, I'm part of the Hull and uh, East Riding Embroiderers Guild. And mm-hmm. it's, it's lovely to actually sit down and do things and to sit down and create things with each other and have the opportunity to to exhibit and share what we've been doing as well. We, we don't all have to be famous to enjoy sharing our work. No, I mean, creative is a wonderful way of actually meeting other people mm. because you come together and you want to do something. You're not expecting someone to give it to you. And you never really know which direction it's going to go as soon as you introduce more than one or two people. The old ideas. It well, can be quite fun along for the ride. Well, absolutely. And you're saying you, you host workshops. So you're kind of used to that environment. You, you've been you've teaching for a long time as well. So I guess that brings the sociability and community aspects into your world as well. Oh, certainly, yes. Mm. Yeah. No, it would be a very sad world if it was all quiet true now then after we've been looking at the excitement of being in the open galleries and and exhibiting and so on do you have any stories to share with us Fran and I bet you do of when something didn't go quite as planned and was possibly a bit of a disaster or certainly didn't work out how you wanted it to and what did you learn from that experience (laughs) (laughs) well I'm afraid I tend to turn most of my creative disasters into my next big thing. Right, yeah, good. Which is always useful. Yeah. But I suppose um, this last Open Studios, I I exhibit in my front room, which is my workroom. Right. And to, you know, draw people in, I put some work hanging up on the outside of the house and into the garden. A lovely, bright, clear day, but a tad on the windy side. And the piece I had hanging outside the front door was about a six foot, about the size of a door. Right, wow. And I was chatting to this gentleman, stood very elegantly and beautifully poised and very articulate in the middle of my living room. And the wind blew, (laughs) and I just saw this piece of work blow gently. (laughs) Right the way across the bay window, <laughs> straight into the rose bush. <laughs> At which point, descended from the dizzy high of aesthetic appreciation to, oh, hell! Squawking <laughs> and flapping as you ran to rescue your piece of work, no doubt. Well, I actually res- I rescued the rose bush. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yes, not one of my finer moments. <laughs> So what did you learn from that? How to fasten your work more securely to your house? (laughs) Screws top and bottom. (laughs) Well, I think you also learn not to be precious. Well, yes. Yes, that's probably quite a good point, actually. So when... So I think it's very good that you've used all your bits and pieces up, and that's often a theme that other guests have shared as well. And I think that's particularly prevalent in the style of work that you do and other people who've got that kind of ephemeral mixed media looking at edges that kind of approach actually you can't really define whether something's gone wrong or not can you because who would ever know anyway unless you told them nobody knows what it was going to look like and you you know half the time we don't even know ourselves what it's going to look like until it it turns up but um, do you have any of those dreaded unfinished objects lurking around in the back of cupboards? Those. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm afraid I don't. Mm. I mean, I had one piece which spent the winter being, well, well last winter being muttered at. Mm. It wasn't right. It was a very long piece. And I didn't get the aesthetic right. The composition didn't work on the mm-hmm. scale of it. I mean, it was about eight foot wide yeah and last week i took a pair of scissors to it and chopped it in half i've got two smaller pieces which work much better nothing really goes to waste things will get scrapped but they're past the learning curve claim to be a waste well no and big pieces like that 
Is that, is that the scale? You, you know, you mentioned the size of the door and a, and a big piece there. Do you normally work on a larger scale than smaller or a mixture? A mixture. I find if I work just at one scale, I start just using single techniques or I just find one way of resolving a problem. Whereas mm -hmm. if you change the scale, because you're just using stitch, you have to find new ways of keeping, keeping that adventure going, keeping the questioning going. So a mixture of scales suits me best. Right. And that's an interesting point that I haven't come across of adapting technique to the size or in a response to solving problems. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah well, you do it with whatever media you use. Yeah. You're always seeking you know, a better way, a more streamlined way, a more effective way, or sometimes a quieter way of doing something. What would you say then to... The idea of how do you plan your work with just the saying about long distant elephants, so those items that seem so far away when you first agree oh, okay. that you're going to do them, and then they slowly creep up, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, the deadline's next week. How do you manage to keep your work organized, given that you also have your teaching? schedule and the your commissions how, how do you keep yourself organized but keep that creativity flowing Fran um, easy answer I don't <laughs> becoming more and more aware that I don't I need big deadlines right I really do and I can do long-term planning where I get everything sorted out really early and I can do last minute ditch efforts where decisions have to be made so they are made and you get it done. Yes. But that bit in the middle, I'm flabby. Ah. I really am. I just flounder around in there. You know, it's no great bump and push. You know, the excitement's passed and it's just down to the slog. So that's why I, I find I keep loads of pieces of work on the go. Hmm. I mean, I was looking around my workspace at the minute. I've got. Two in the middle of being done. I've got three which are just about done and I'm sort of like guest framing them at the minute to see whether I think they are finished. Yeah. And I've got, I think, another two waiting to be framed. Decisions have been made, but I haven't actually got them to the framing yet. Yes, yes. No, I'm not very good at that kind of level of organisation. Things tend to happen. Is there... Any any ideas that you think might help cope with that middle <laughs> flabby area? I've had people are here sharing about mind maps or diaries or oh, I'm no. obsessed with plans and things. You know, well, I have two diaries. Yeah, one which was supposed to be the things that I do, and the other one which is the things that I need to do. Right. It would be useful if I knew where they were. <laughs> I have wall planners. I think one of them says August. <laughs> I, I'm afraid this is what I am. This is who I am. This is part of being me. But I have to have, I could really do with somebody with a very large boot coming up every now and again, maybe popping in once a month, <laughs> just applying it. You want somebody like me nagging on in the background. <laughs> I do that with my branch skills, you know, right, we've got all these things, we've got this to do and that to do, and they all start rolling yeah. around and tutting it. Oh, she's on about plans and things again. <laughs> Well, things do seem to get done. I know yeah. I could do an awful lot more, but at the moment I'm trundling along. I'm building up. I'm still actually building my practice. Yes. So I'm, you know, dipping toes into new things. I mean, I've got two events planned for next year, but I want another four or five. Yes. So I'm, you know, I'll sit on the computer of an evening and trawl through various arty sites and crafty sites looking mm. for opportunities yes and when those are in place then i will structure everything else in. yes and i think that leads nicely into talking about future plans the plans and projects that you've got penciled in that you might want to share with us yeah well i'm doing as i said the open studios in york yes that's the big spring thing I've got a commitment with the Blossom Street Gallery. They're getting involved in the Literary Festival. Oh, nice. They wanted some artwork combining, you know, text and image. Yes. Where I'm heading at the minute, so that fits in brilliantly. Yes, lovely. So I'll definitely have to get that sorted. Mm -hmm. 
there's the Salt Air Arts Trail, which again is next, well, early summer. Yes. Which I've just put applications in for. There's a possibility of a textile fair in London. And I've got a whole host of galleries, which I've got all the letters ready. I'm going to be sending out, so be warned. <laughs> so things are in the pipeline. And that's a, that's a nice place to be, though, isn't it? To have those thoughts and opportunities. And I think it also emphasises the fact that these things don't just appear out of fresh air. It's well, part of our... Yeah work in general is to go out you know we have to go out and find things as well um Very much so. you have to be proactive you I do mean, I did the ripon uh, the northern the arts, arts show and that was in yeah. ripon cathedral yes yeah that was my first year of doing that mm -hmm. and that was an interesting experience yes and hopefully from there i've, I've tapped into some some places over there and I've got to go back there and follow up and see if they, instead of a chat, they become opportunities to exhibit or joining groups and things like this. You build it. It doesn't yes. happen. No, no. And that's exactly the same. I've gone through the same experience myself running and building my online marketing business. Exactly the same. You have to go out and look for opportunities and generate opportunities. Just the same. So it was very interesting that you brought that point up um, to, to highlight that these things don't just fall out of the sky. We have to go and work at getting those opportunities as well. So thank you for bringing that point out. That was really great. I'm not saying that I'm good at it. <laughs> no. Always be welcoming to any millionaire who happens to be passing in need of textiles. Yes. <laughs> and I also noticed that you're, you've set up a, a Facebook group as well. Is that something yeah. you want to kind of share about and try and draw up some new members? Well, I started a my own sort of like textile page. Yes. And I got really bored because I was the only person posting on it. So... I mean, I do these little classes and I work at the loom, so I, I have a few contacts around. Yes. So I think it was just last week or the week before, I just mm. started, you know, trawling around to see if other people would like to an opportunity to post and be part of the group and stuff. So we've just gradually launching that. I mean, it's very low-key at the minute, under the glorious name of Stitchiness. Stitchiness. I, th I thought that was a lovely name, actually, Stitchiness. Yeah, and, well... It's quite good fun because I've now had more conversation with some of my stitchy friends. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which is good. And hopefully as more and more people get involved, it'll have a broader range. And it's, it's like anything. You get out of things what you put in. And so it's nice to be able to take part in groups like that and share work and so on. Um, a, an early guest, a friend of mine, Jane White, who's the couture tuition, she recently set up a group for, for, for a sim similar idea, and, and that's going amazingly well. You know, she's really enjoying the engagement that's happening there and the sharing and so on. So it, it, yeah. it's something that works particularly well, I think, in that kind of textile and creative group, as long as people want to take part. If you've got a load of people just sitting on the sidelines, and as you say, you finish up being the only one posting, and after a while you just think, oh, dear. Well, yeah, it is, it is that element of sharing. Yes. Feed off each other. Exactly. And I've got certain areas where I have a, a wealth of expertise, particularly in making mistakes. And I know other people have different strengths, different areas of expertise. And I would really like to pick their brains on occasions. I'll have no objection to other people asking me things either. Yeah, and that's that's really perfect to have a group like that on the go as well. So I hope that goes well. And anybody Thank listening you. wants to go and join Fran's Stitchiness group, so she'll welcome you there. So that's on Facebook, isn't it? Yeah, that's yeah. a Facebook thing. Fran, thank you so much for sharing your stitchery story with us today. It's been absolutely fascinating. You've shared some really interesting nuggets of story and in, uh, information with us, which are quite unique. I've really enjoyed <laughs> picking very away polite. at some of those. Oh, that is very polite of you. <laughs> so positively. <laughs> I'm a very positive person. No, it's been absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Now, you so give me a list of the places where we can find out more about your work. So we've basically got your 
and I'll put all of these links in your episode on the Stitchery Stories website. So we've got your Facebook page. Facebook page, which is Fran Textiles. Yeah. There's your website. I also blog. And I have to say, I really like Fran's blog. You keep it up to date. It's it's entertaining. It's quite witty. Quite um, it's, it's very, very honest. It's lovely as a description of the trials and tribulations of textile art. I think it's just great. I really enjoy reading your blog. Thank you very much. There's lots of ways. And I know you do have a newsletter as well, don't you? So people can sign up for yeah. that. Yep, you can just contact me through any point. I'll respond. Johnny, good. Well, there we are. So there's the ways in which you can get in touch with Fran. She's running that sat in her Facebook group uh, going as well. And if you're in the York area, then she's at the Viking Loom, which for those of you who don't know, is a, it's like an embroidery textile art shop. So we'll stick that link on there as well for, for Viking oh, Loom. Thank you very much. That'd be very pleased. So there we are, Fran. It's been wonderful speaking to you. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm sure everybody will too. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. If you like this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitch Me Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and offers from our lovely guests please visit stitcherystories.com to join the fan club. Of course, if you have iTunes, then subscribe there to automatically get new episodes. And why not leave us a review and rating whilst you are there? So that is the end of our Stitchery story for today. So keep stitching, keep smiling, and keep creating your very own Stitchery stories. <laughs>